Jake Ludington here at Discover 2015, and I'm here with Paul Muller. And Synergy has kind of been the big hardware story here at Discover. Yeah. But there's a software component to it that I think that, that hasn't actually been very widely addressed by, by any of the hardware team. And, and that is, so I, I asked the question of how is this really different than containerization or virtualization? Like what are the key benefits that somebody's going to get from Synergy from the software side of the house? Yeah, it's a really great question. And I, I think I understand the confusion. From our perspective, I guess the first thing we need to recognize is it's all about the app, right? And so much of the discussion about the infrastructure skips the fact that it's there to support the application. Um, whether it's containerization or virtualization, applications will, will create demand for certain kinds of infrastructure. And certain apps are going to need, for example, to be prioritized for memory, or they're going to be prioritized for I.O., or they might be prioritized for um, CPU or, or networking. The challenge is, is that the developer usually best understands those needs. In a traditional environment, for Synergy, they'd have to go and talk to their operations people and say, hey, listen, can you pull some tiles? Or not even pull tiles, can you jump on your, on your GUI and change the configuration of the fabric for me, for my application? With Synergy, the developer is now able to communicate directly to the infrastructure and specify the things they need. So this really kind of goes beyond, because I mean, like containerization, you can, you can configure containers so that, in theory, they can auto-scale forever until you run out of, uh, until you run out of resources, yeah. right? But, so, so how is this truly different than that? Well, you use the word theory, right? Theory is a funny thing. So the container might be able to, for example, scale horizontally. If you need another microservice for bandwidth reasons or for um, demand reasons, let's just say you're running a website and you need to spool up another instance of Cloud Foundry, for example, then doing that with uh, microservices and containers is, is really easy, as you say. The challenge is, is if you've got an application, let's just say that your app is um, is one that is heavily dependent on processing through CPU, but also needs to be able to write data to and from disk. So it's a big data app, for example, would be a canonical example of that. Um, typically, when you've got a lot of disk, you usually have a lot of I.O. When you've got a lot of I.O., you need a lot of channels. And so you might, for example, as a developer, want to, be, want to say, I don't just want a regular container. I need, a, I need a, a, an underlying fabric or infrastructure that has a lot of I.O. channels, uh, where those I.O. channels are prioritized from a latency standpoint against, say, for example, networking. That's something today that a container doesn't give the developer control over. The containers are comparatively dumb in that regard. So, so in that sense, does that mean Synergy is going to replace the need for containers? No, I think the, the, the challenge here, and, and the, one of the reasons why we're excited about the Synergy announcements, is that we're presenting those APIs up to developers. And so we've signed up a huge number of developers prior to announcements, so we had a whole bunch of skunk works going on behind the scenes with companies like Docker and others, Eaton for example, um, who are working with us to build their management apps and tie into those underlying Synergy APIs so that, that for example, the container um, management platform, the Docker platform, is capable of doing some of those things on behalf of the developer, or at least exposing it to the developers so that they can do it themselves. So, so in theory then, Docker could then go out and request more I.O., or it could request more memory, or it could request more networking um, through the container? You, the whole point is making the fabric, the infrastructure software defined. Uh, and, and so that, yes, that would be the idea. And again, it really boils down to who's the right person to be controlling that. Now, of course, there are, as with, with all things programmable, we need to be thinking hard about how we, who and how we allow that to happen. Um, but the fact that it's now possible to do that without, as I said, having to get the developer to call an engineer every time they want a change made to the physical fabric. And again, we've been able to do it for CPU before with virtualization. Now it's about network. It's about server, uh, sorry, it's about um, compute. It's about memory. It's about um, I.O. Being able to control all of that fabric is an enormous breakthrough. So how does this change resilience? Because I mean, we've, we've sort of built our, around the idea that you can recover easily, um, and, and instances, particularly if you're only looking at, at CPU scale, yep. um, are, are fairly easy to just like, come back quickly. What, th this sounds like it's a whole new le level of complexity. Well, I actually think it's, it's, it, it actually benefits us from a, from a resilience standpoint, not easy to say. Um, the reason I say that is because one of the other challenges I found in, when I was in IT ops was uh, when you were doing, creating a DR environment, you had to replicate not just the logical construct of your application, which you, know, you typically could do with a backup, is the obvious simple way to do that, but there was no way to, to do the same thing from a physical standpoint. It's like, you know, what port did I plug 
that Ethernet cable into on the back of the server because if I, if I swap them around, then I might find that you know my 10 dot my 10 dot X network and my 15 dot X network are swapped around the wrong ports, and I'm going to the, the app won't actually fire up. And so by being able to specify the physical infrastructure configuration through a software interface, we're actually able to create better resilience because you can quite literally use the software to redefine the infrastructure in your DR environment, for example, whether that's failover or catastrophic failure in the case of full DR. So we think that'll actually improve what we call RPO, recovery point objectives. So, re so really this is coming down to um, the, the underlying recovery doesn't actually care about what the, what the networking port was. It doesn't care what the... the, the I want to be really clear, use the word theoretically before. So theoretically, it does abstract a lot of that away. Of course, there's no free lunch. We, you know, we, the diligence is still required, but the level of control that we afford now means that I think a lot of what was previously manual work, error-prone work, can now be pushed into automation and software. Again, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Diligence is still required, but it's certainly a huge leap forward. And the interesting part is that every industry analyst Every one of our developer partners who's looked at this thing is blown away by what it can do. I just think to your point, it's going to take a little while for people to understand the subtleties um, uh, and the profound change that this level of control affords. Now, is this, is this something where we might look at uh, down the road, sort of a, a resilience from the standpoint of the application can look and say, all of a sudden this networking path is blocked, I should go the other way? It's a good question, actually. I hadn't really thought about it in in in, in that context. I, it's probably one for me to think about, to be perfectly honest. It's a, it's an interesting question. But resilience, I guess you, re, you raise a really important point, which is that's the other element we're seeing more and more of at the moment, is how do I design for graceful degradation, to your point, right? So if something does change in the fabric, how do I gracefully degrade rather than degrade completely? And that's the sort of scenario, where, for example, where if you've got an e-tailing site, you might say, well, actually, look, if the network's a little squiffy, there's a nice phrase for you, if the network's not behaving as I'd expect it to, then let's degrade, for example, back-end functions first in deference to the user experience at the front end, because the one thing we don't want to do is stop serving pages to my customers, but maybe you know the back-end connection, we can queue some stuff and deal with that later. So that's a good example of how that level of control might help you make real-time decisions about what you want to do with your users. All right, well, I, I look forward to see where Synergy and software come together in a, in, in a workable way. Well, you want to you grab, grab your C compiler and jump in. Maybe later. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. Thanks, mate.